Well, it's really, really wonderful uh, to be here, and I'm, I'm, I've met m many of you, some of you uh, several times, and others are new to me. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, very glad uh, f for both uh, m of my inviters and uh, thankful for their leadership of this project, which I think is just one of the many, many things that this center does that are amazing and awesome. And if I was, you know, 40 years younger and wandering around trying to find a job, I would come here because, uh, because it just feels like what the center does is so significant and has uh, been involved in such important conversations over the years. So let me first uh, just admit that I uh, am a longtime pastor. Over uh, 40 years, I've been ordained, and probably uh, 30 of those years uh, were spent in Berkeley. And Berkeley is a weird and wonderful place to be as a pastor. Um, it's the place that often when I'm not speaking at Berkeley, people think there's really a church in Berkeley. Like, like really, it's a surprising thing that there's a church in Berkeley. Uh, yeah, it, it is a surprising thing that there's a church in Berkeley. There are actually more than one uh, churches in Berkeley. And uh, it turns out that it really is an edgy and wonderful community. Very counterintuitive to try to be a Christian in a, in a crazy place like Berkeley, California, uh, which was exactly why I loved serving there, because it was so peculiar. And uh, when you went to work, you just knew that what you were doing, uh, you hoped, would contribute to the welfare of a community that was that was clearly dynamic. <laughs> These are all euphemisms for other things like crazy and insane and divided and sometimes hostile, um, but really fundamentally just deeply human and a place that I was very, very glad that I could be. So those years brought me eventually to Fuller Seminary. Um, and I've been there for four years on the faculty and then for almost 10 years as the, as the president. Uh, and as Richard said, I'm done um, at the end of, of this calendar year. So that's a big transition. I want to um, have us reflect on this issue of what it means to find our home and place in a time like this and, um, and the difficulties that we face. I mean, at, at Fuller, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, we went instantaneously online. We were already heavily online, so that was not a big crisis to us to go to online, but it certainly took a lot of adjusting to get the whole institution to be online. And, and then it was more following the personal stories, which over the years of the height of the pandemic uh, were intense. And we had uh, not a large number of people that died from it, but we had se uh, several that died from it, and we had a large number of people that over time were infected and and often lived in, in large families with other uh, people who were also infected. So it was a complicated and uh, difficult time trying to figure out how do we care for people? How do we make available a different kind of metric around performance for students that was somehow at least trying to be responsive to what it was that they were talking about and so forth. So all that was, uh, was a very key. It also felt like institutionally, like it was an invitation to change from my point of view. It felt like almost immediately this was gonna be longer than any of us think or want it to be. Um, it would be better for us, uh, I declared about 10 days in, uh, to give up incrementalism, which is sort of the love language of academics, um, and, and instead actually make decisions that we have struggled to make. Let's make them and then let's, initiate, let's actually implement them and move forward rather than to actually be in this abeyance. Let's use this as an opportunity to actually make much more progress and change. Along the way, we started a project of a similar kind of name called Rethinking Church in the 21st Century. It has three expressions. One expression is what Fuller itself is wanting to do. Another expression is a gathering of about 35 or 40 uh, people from around the country, uh, primarily people of color, very, very, very diverse uh, collection. And then um, uh, an international group of about 30 people from from 30 different countries around the world. I meet with each group for about three hours every month, and we've been uh, doing some significant work, and some of the fruit of that work is going to begin to start appearing. It's been um, an amazing thing, especially in the international group, to be in, to, to realize as we were going on that probably 50% um, of the people that are in that group either live under dictatorships or in any case in totalitarian states, and that their number one crisis really about the church is not the, the way that it would be expressed in the United States with all of our inherent challenges and, and nuclear explosions that we have set off uh, on ourselves, um, but instead by really talking about persecution and suffering, what it really means to live 
in a context where violence against you, against your body, against your people, against people of your faith, uh, was not only not uncommon, it was very common and often, uh, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis, part of the threatening reality that we would talk about in terms of what it meant to live into that reality. So all of that to say that that when I began to think about this invitation and we were discussing some various options of how the conversation might unfold, I was drawn to, to just want to offer up some reflections from the earliest part of the book of Daniel, which is a book that I'm sure many of us have studied and reflected on, but it's one that I think, from my point of view, is an extremely helpful book uh, at a time like this. We all know that there's, there's sort of two great paradigms in, in the Hebrew scriptures. One is the exile, I mean the exodus rather, which is obviously the most dominant and continues out in the most dominant way in the New Testament. But the second one, which is both in the Hebrew scriptures and also significant in the New Testament, is the paradigm of the exile. The two paradigms themselves put side by side are worth reflecting on because they are in some ways have similarities, but they fundamentally have really different instincts. In one case, of course, being under the impression, oppression of Egypt is a certain paradigm that is not the paradigm in the way that it's introduced in the book of Daniel. Yes, Israel is under the pressure of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, but in that case, unlike Egypt's case, God is the one who actually sends Israel into exile. It's not simply political oppression, it's really a form of spiritual discipline of saying to Israel, okay, I've sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet to tell you uh, about the things that I want you to consider and how I want your lives and your communal relationships and your relationship to the earth and your relationship to uh, all, all classes and levels of society and culture to be rearranged by the faith. And in this case, what's happening in exile is that God's saying, that failed, you simply were unwilling to respond. I'm now sending Nebuchadnezzar as my ambassador to bring you into exile in order to then ask you as Israel again, so when you're now a people in exile, stripped of your land, stripped of your temple, stripped of the habits of high holy days, stripped of any political and social power, stripped of the land itself, most significantly. Now who are you going to be, and how do you understand and know yourself? Now, I don't think it takes uh, a lot to understand that in many ways, America has this myth that we were, and, and sometimes it's a myth, and sometimes it's not necessarily a myth, but it's a stretch. We were, in some narratives, understood to be a place of exodus, where many came to the shores, by no means all, in any way. Some, especially of European stock, came to North America as, as people who were escaping the oppression of, of Europe and felt that they would find religious freedom in the United States. It's an, it's an exodus paradigm. And out of that, unfortunately, is, is ultimately born things like uh, Manifest Destiny, like uh, the American Dream, like many, many other things that end up taking that narrative and spinning it ultimately into a religious, not only a religious vocation, but almost a religious, quote, right. Now, for those who did not come to the shores in that way, um, they have, they've always been in exile in, these, in this context. They've been put um, under the pressure. Uh, and, and so the, the black and brown church in the United States, while it has many, many expressions and can dangerously be overstated, uh, it is it is a remarkably contrasting narrative that I would say is more about living in exile but looking for exodus. And for the white church in America, it's thinking that you live in the promised land when, when, in, when in fact it's completely blind to the abuses of that whole narrative. So we have these conflicting narratives, which is why I find the exodus and exile paradigms just worth reflecting on. That's a much larger and, you know, like, a week-long set of reflections that we could have, so I, I'm not t focusing on all that. The book of Daniel, as you know, is one of the most important books in the Hebrew Scriptures that leads us into the, into the ex exilic paradigm. And it starts dramatically, as you know, in chapter 1, simply says that they have been sent it by, and conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, that the best and the brightest are taken into Nebuchadnezzar's house, that they're given new names, new languages, new poetry, um, a new pantheon of structures, ideas, frameworks, all to try to bring them into conformity 
uh, assimilation, really, in the hope that the best and the brightest will then become leaders that will bring all of Israel under the, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon itself. So it's an amazing opening chapter. You, I'm sure, are aware that the thing that happens in the, that very first chapter that's the most significant dramatically is, not, is actually not the conquering. It's actually what happens for Daniel and his friends as they are now living in Nebuchadnezzar's house, being forced in every corpuscle of their life to conform and assimilate. And then, right in the middle of that, they have the courage to say, just a minute, we, we're okay, the text seems to imply, with most of all this, except for one thing. We want to eat our own food and observe our own dietary law. This becomes, in my mind, the, the first major stake in what it means to live a faithful, exilic life. And some understand and weigh heavily in on the, the fact that this is a, a continuation of legal uh, practice and, and uh, religious law. But while it can be interpreted that way, I actually think it functions in Daniel in a very different way. It's not just a law. It's actually a practicing of identity. So in the middle of being told you are not the people that you were, you do not have the power that you had, you do not have the land or the temple or the law, none of those things are now present. How will you remember who you are? And Daniel and his friends said, well, we'll remember who we are because every time we eat at this table, we will be saying to ourselves, we may live in Nebuchadnezzar's house, but we belong to Yahweh. Now, that to me is the is the absolutely um, minimal and essential core of what then un begins to unfold in the book of Daniel. They are completely thrown in and expect to assimilate, to do all the jobs that they're assigned, to serve the great enemy, to bow down uh, in some sort of way to the practices and influences. And yet, and yet, and yet, they had the courage to name that they wanted one practice. It's just interesting to me they don't say, we have a list of 42 things that need to be done. No, they just say, it, as it's represented in the text, there's this one thing. We need dietary practices. And they don't expound, really, to Nebuchadnezzar and his friends on why that would be. They just seem to ask for it. Because they are no longer, they're not weakened by this, which they're tested for, as you might remember, um, the food is enough to sustain them and to be able to do their labor and work. So therefore, let's, um, let's go forward, Nebuchadnezzar and his house says. So they live in Nebuchadnezzar's house. They eat at Nebuchadnezzar's table, but they eat, in quotes, Yahweh's food. That is really, really, really a key piece of what I think unfolds. We'll come back to that in a minute. That's chapter one. In chapter two, I'm going to focus on chapter three. In chapter two, what happens is that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, <clears throat> the most powerful person in the land, a rageaholic, a crazy man, very, very, very deeply insecure. I don't know if any of us have he ever heard of leaders like that. Um, and, and what it turns out is that he's so, so anxious in this particular case because of a dream that he's had that he's looking for real, credible spiritual authority. And he quickly turns to his soothsayers and says, you have to tell me the dream and the interpretation of the dream. And they say, no, no, remember, Nebuchadnezzar, that's not how this works. First you tell us the dream, then we tell you, the, and then they go around that mulberry bush a couple times. And then he says, no, no, and it will be off with your head if, in fact, you don't tell me both the dream and the interpretation of the dream. Asking for more than he would ever otherwise ask because what's at stake is more urgent and more threatening than it has ever been. Therefore, I don't want the song and dance of how you might give, quote, meaning I want a real and credible spiritual witness. Now, that is the second great crisis um, in this. The, I mean, it's the, the first crisis is, is the real crisis. The second crisis is Nebuchadnezzar's crisis. Um, and, and he goes around and threatens everyone. And, and then, fascinatingly, Daniel steps forward and asks sort of to the side, so what's going on and what's the, what, what is this all about and what is he demanding? And he, instead of stepping away from that, he calls together his band and says, okay, you guys, this time we really have to pray. <laughs> this is not 
this is not in our bailiwick. We couldn't possibly do this. There is nothing about this that is actually ours to be able to produce. Nebuchadnezzar has a real spiritual crisis. We are claiming to have a real spiritual life with the God of the universe who has made promises to Israel. And we, we can actually therefore go to that God and beg for what clearly we have no capacity to offer. This is not us whipping up our own dance show. This is really a real voice with real religious credibility. So by God's uh, great gift, they provide this. Now what happens is also really significant. Before Daniel and his friends go back, having received this good news, they first stop, and the text makes a great point, of the fact that they pray with great obeisance and humility before God. This was not ours. We're not going to go to to the most threatening and powerful person in the world, but that's not really their observation at all. What they want to be sure that God knows is that they know this is God's. That is a really critical thing. You could so easily imagine as a person in exile wanting to turn all these events to their own personal advantage, if not to their own personal identity, to make sure that they were getting in tight. And when they eventually do then go to Nebuchadnezzar, they likewise say to Nebuchadnezzar, now, Nebuchadnezzar, in case you have any thought that this is something we've produced, it's not true. It's not about us. It's about the God that we worship. This is this is extraordinary uh, material because it's, it's underscoring the clarity of their spiritual theological vision. We've lost everything. We are alone in the world. We have no way of getting our bearings on how to make sense of, of this exilic life. We're trying to carry on and stay alive. Our people are captive. We are the lucky ones, in quotes, that got into Nebuchadnezzar's house. But the people that are still in Israel and are, and are leaving Israel as well are people that are scattered and without apparent hope because of the domination of of Nebuchadnezzar's power. So they want to come to Nebuchadnezzar and say, this doesn't have to do with us. We're not trying to get in tight with you. You don't have any particular reason to favor us. I mean, all of that is implied, it seems to me, in the text. We're not looking for your favor. We're looking to satisfy your crisis, which is a real, credible word. Now, if you think about what it means to be a faithful exile, they, we could all wax eloquently and at great length about what that little vortex means. How do people who claim real religious credibility actually simply give it away rather than politicize, um, turn it into revenue streams, <laughs> scale it for our advantage, build billboards, scale the social media networks, No, how do you just show up and freely and accurately give away the reality of a God who could actually tell both what the dream was and what it meant? And even though the dream is rightly terrifying because it is actually about Nebuchadnezzar's dissolution and his kingdom going to fall, that reality he receives actually is good news. I know now that you have credibility because you actually told me the truth. The terror of the night that kept me awake, that begged for real credible answers, it's witness to. You took that and the way that you've told me the dream and its interpretation is authentic. And they even say, oh my gosh, Nebuchadnezzar, this is a terrible dream. We don't really want to tell you this dream. We're not trying to tell you this dream. We're not trying to be threatening to you. They have no idea what Nebuchadnezzar himself might quote, no, right? He's just terrified. They come back with really bad news. Your kingdom is falling. And he says, thank you and bless your God. (laughs) I mean, this is like a crazy set, right? Where you're just thinking, how could that possibly be? Why? Because it had credibility. It It was truly credible. The great crisis of the church in America right now and that needs to be plural, of course, because there isn't such a thing as the church in America, but I'm just saying, in all the manifestations of the church in America, the question is, does it have any credibility? And and that is not measured by looking at each other. It's measured by looking at the God that we claim to worship. Is the church a manifestation of the credibility of God? And the great scandal, the sorrow, the heartache of the way that especially white evangelicalism and other Uh, parts of the church as well, but especially the way the white evangelical church 
has done so much to deeply multi-generationally discredit the name of Jesus and of the gospel itself in this era is just devastating. It's as though we have decided to not have credibility, moral credibility, spiritual credibility, theological credibility, social credibility, compassion credibility. I mean, you know, we could go on and on of the losses of the of credibility that has just gone in every direction, right? You cannot rebuild credibility except one dream at a time. You don't get to just say, okay, now we're back. <laughs> oh, please just accept, we're, we're back, we're fully credible. No, we were never credible in many ways to begin with. That's it's a longer talk. Um, but even starting with the pretext that we at least had greater credibility than where we are right now, really just places on the table. So where's the credibility? Where's the credibility around justice? Where's the credibility around compassion? Where's the credibility around race? Where's the credibility, et cetera, et cetera, right? I mean, these are really amazing things. And what I find is that people are not looking for a perfect church. I've, you know, in all the craziness of Berkeley and people who came to faith as adults, they came to faith not because the church I was pastoring, heavens knows, was a perfect church. That's just not the case. Nor was the gospel we presented a portrait that we were the answer. The only way that you can have a credible witness is if you're witnessing to a credible God. And the accountability that we have to that is the major crisis. It is not the crisis of, oh gosh, we're having young people leave the church. Oh gosh. But those are all symptoms and symptomatic of, of much deeper rot. And the deeper rot, in my view, is the loss of this fundamental connection to the credibility of God. Now, the gospel and Jesus himself says many times, of course, you're going to be persecuted for this. And of course, this will cost you. And of course, this will be difficult. And of course, it will also bring you joy. But, but in the middle of all that, it's because it's connected in a reflection of God, not because we kind of read the times and figured out how to move on the waves. Um, that's not really how it worked. It was much more that people were credible because they thought, lived, acted, and responded to the reality of God, revealed in Jesus Christ as Christians would believe. That, that is an amazing ground shift. And the question then, what does it mean to have a credible witness? It means that our lives and our words, despite, as in this text, despite the threats of Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, they tried to pray for God to give them this answer and escape um, the beheading that was thre otherwise threatened. And they did that, but now they don't know if going to tell that news to Nebuchadnezzar is gonna mean off with their heads, right? They just don't know how that's gonna go. And then it turns out he thanks them for this really terrible news because it's actually about the truth. Like that, that is the, the significance of chapter two worthy of more reflection. Chapter three is the one I really actually want to focus on. So all that was prelude. Now we're into chapter three. Okay. So in chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar builds his nightmare in chapter two. So the image of this tower with a base of stubble and a crown of gold, he actually builds that. What an understandable and frankly familiar practice this is. We, we take our fearful idols and then we just want to control them, right? So first we yield to them and then we want to overcome them by controlling them. We buy them, we close off options, we take away distractions. We want to make sure that we are the ones in control of the danger. So Nebuchadnezzar does this. I mean, it's about his kingdom falling apart. So he decides, okay, then then let's build this sucker and let me tell the world that in fact this is the way that it's going to be and I, Nebuchadnezzar, am bowing and am then calling you to bow down to the idol that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Now, here's what I want you to, I will read now. Um, am I going on way too long already? No, okay. Um, so listen to the, I know this text is familiar to you, but listen to the way that the language of the text actually carries its message, okay? King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar 
sent for the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the magistrates, the treasurers, and all of the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And when they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and to worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This is so magical. I mean, it's just, it captures in its language and in its rhythms exactly what the text is, is building toward. So first of all, remember, he's terrorized by the nightmare of chapter two. Secondly, he builds it. And then he makes it the centerpiece. Did you hear the number of repetitive claims of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up? That's the key phrase. It's not that it was just built. It was that King Nebuchadnezzar had set it up. So in other words, still further bolstering his sense of control and mastery of the nightmare. And then did you hear the repetition of these phrases, right? So then when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you shall worship, you shall bow down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. All dictators, all maniacal dictators especially, really understand the force of music and the force of what I call mesmerizing rhythms. Conformity just always works better when you have mesmerizing rhythms present. You just hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire mu musical ensemble. You shall bow down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Culture understands this. I do have to say, as a Cal Bear, that it seems especially powerful to be on USC's campus reading this text because it does just take a tiny opening moment before I already have a response as a Calvert to the USC fight song. Why? Because it's not my fight song. Um, and also because it is USC's fight song. <laughs> With all due respect, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, and and the, whole, the whole point of that, power of that, is everybody knows just what they're supposed to do. And the, the triggers of culture, whether it's the trigger of an announcement of a, of a sale or a new revelation of a product by Apple or a, uh, a, a crisis of some political rhetoric or whatever it is, it just takes a few notes and everybody knows how this song goes and where it's gonna go and what we're supposed to do as a response. And if you're looking for conformity, this is one of the most powerful instinctive ways of instilling it. Every dictator, and a uh, maniacal dictator especially, understands this. Hitler would be the most obvious, more current example and the prominence of music, but also, interestingly, the Billy Graham crusade at one stage in its history realized that there were many, many people that were coming forward because of singing Just As I Am. And they realized that it was leading to, to false positives, you might say, where they, they would, they would come forward, supposedly making a protest of faith, but when they actually studied it, it was actually a much more complicated emotional and even bodily response to the moment than it was actually to the gospel. And at that stage, they dropped that. It was sung in the repertoire, but it was not part of that moment in the Crusades because they realized it was a mesmerizing rhythm that created a false positive. Now, 
all of us are living contexts where we're aware of this, right? And the political rhetoric of division that we all face right now is about the mesmerizing rhythms of left and right. You just have to make a few sounds. It's just a few words, and you know exactly whether you are enraged by what it is that's being said, said or whether you're wanting to cheer it on, whichever it might be. And it's all set in motion by this mesmerizing rhythms. Companies depend on it. Apple has mastered it and technology has allowed it to be dialed in now so that it's actually specific to you and to me. Technology tells us what we have told them we like, what cues us, what gets us going, which, what causes us to do more searches than we might otherwise do. It just takes that moment. Now the question in this era for me is that, that there is this huge sense that the American church has gotten cued by the wrong music. It's not our song, and we are completely addicted to it. And we will bow down to the idol, and it comes in so many different forms, whether it's a cultural idol or specifically a religious idol, whether it's our type or that type or their type, all of those things are, are cues that tell us where we find our place, as opposed to actually the clarity that we need to remember. This is where the text is going, as you'll remember. Now, their lives were saved in chapter two, the lives of certain soothsayers of Nebuchadnezzar's were saved by Israel in chapter two because they were able to deliver the dream uh, and its interpretation. The soothsayers didn't get killed in the way that chapter two had promised. Now those same soothsayers, referred here as the Chaldeans, come forward and denounce the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, Liar, Trigon, Harp, we know your song, Nebuchadnezzar. We, we can sing your song. Listen to us. We're singing your song. And we're singing it because we're doing the right thing. But then as the text says, but there are certain Jews. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. They know the threat of the danger that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and his friends could easily replace them. They need to protect their own stake in this game. Now there's a subterfuge going on. Let's get rid of Israel and these certain Jews in your house, those, those people, well, they're not doing what you actually required them to do. So though you like them at the end of chapter two, now we're turning them in. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, to bow down and worship the golden, <laughs> to bow down and worship the golden statue that I have set up, fine. And if you don't, I will throw you into furnace hotter than anything. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? This is the ultimate little paradigm, right, of the crisis. So he takes control of his nightmare, he believes that now he's in charge, even though Daniel and his friends have said all of this news is really in the hands of the God who raises up kings and lowers kings. And, you know, that includes you, Nebuchadnezzar, by the way. In any case, this dream is a negative dream. Now he takes control of the, of the dream. He wants it to be about his dream, the, the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar, the image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. He sets the music in motion, and now he believes his own song, which is full of its own lies. And he believes that he has control of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and makes it really clear that all they need to do is just do what he's required. And then this matrix is set up. So I'm asserting utter power over you. I will throw you into a furnace five times hotter than normal. The dramatic high point of this chapter is not the burning fiery furnace and their deliverance from that. That's, that's an interesting set of events and worthy of reflection of its own. But the high point is right here. It's about power. It's about my power. It's about you conforming to my power. And it's about you being willing to actually do and, and necessarily do what I'm requiring of you. 
And in that moment, what happens is that they utterly clarify the whole situation. And I love the next sentence, as I'm sure many of us do. Oh, you silly little man. <laughs> no, they just say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to give you a defense in this. So right from the start, they're simply announcing that they are unhooked. They're just not hooked. You do not control my life. You don't control the story. You don't control how I'm going to feel about the story. You don't have the supreme power, actually, Nebuchadnezzar. I am, we are unhooked. Then they go on and say, now, we believe God will save us. He might save us. He might not save us. That's sort of not really the question. Because we, and here I'm using my language, not the language of the text, but I think it's what the text is really inferring. Because I can distinguish the greater danger from the lesser danger. And the greater danger is the idolatry. The lesser danger is, is merely life and death. That is an amazing, amazing clarity, right? The spiritual, moral clarity of saying, I won't bow down. I won't participate in this false reality that you believe is reality. I'm actually unhooked from that narrative. God might deliver us, might not. It, it won't matter. But you're not in control. And no, we will not bow down. So the question that this further adds then to this whole mix is in a culture of mesmerizing rhythms, where we are actually far more than we could even measure if we took hours to try to do so, we are the product of a culture that has mesmerizingly taught us what to say and do and how to be. And one way of understanding the nature of God's redemption of Israel and God's redemption uh, as brought in Jesus Christ is this redemption from this false narrative that controls and defines us. Whether it's the control uh, brought about by sheer political power, racial power, gendered power, whatever it might be, these, these narratives that say this is reality. And then we've long since learned from the tiniest of ages to conform ourselves to those practices. But now here we are in this room having lunch on this perfectly lovely day, courtesy of the Lilly Foundation and the glories of USC. And, and in, the, in the middle of all of that, we are called to actually distinguish the greater from the lesser powers, the greater and lesser dangers, and to determine how we can live an unhooked life in order to be able to lead others to live an unhooked life and to be able to be clear about what is the primary danger and what are secondary dangers. That whole combination, which would, again, take hours of our common conversation and reflection, I just think is, is exactly the setup for the moment that we're in. I mean, that's, this is where we live. We live at the moment where there are all kinds of pressures saying to many of us, those of us who are white, I think, in a different way than people of color in the room, I just think there's an extraordinary sense that often people of color, you'll have to respond to this in your own reflections in a minute, actually hear this as being extremely familiar. I think when you're white cultured, you've often had the benefit of so much privilege that it's difficult to even be as fully aware as we need to be of what that fact actually is. But when it starts at least beginning to be really clear how distorting that is, then this passage, it seems to me, also pertains to all of us together, that we are engaged in this really remarkable and easily lost moment. I mean, how much would they understandably decide, well, at least we get to eat the food at Nebuchadnezzar's table and say that we belong to Yahweh? That's not what Nebuchadnezzar will tolerate at this stage. They could have simply been unfaithful to the call to avoid idolatry and have yielded themselves to Nebuchadnezzar's pressure and and say to God, well, I'm sure God knows that I'm not really kneeling in my heart. <laughs> well, that's a sweet idea, but that's not actually what the text is really driving toward, right? No, God isn't looking for simply a quiet, invisible um, obedience of the heart. He actually wants it to show up in real time and place, and especially in places where power is most violent, where power is the most abusive, where it can often be the most distorting. So in that moment, in community, notice this whole, all of this happens in community, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's all, it's not just about the single individual. 
it's the whole community. And the whole community, in the end, gets saved in the fire as well. But the fire, I think, is just a plus. The heart of it, theologically, is right here. The fact that they got saved, hallelujah, they got saved. That was a great thing. That's actually not what this text, I think, is principally saying. What do you do when the, when the crisis is as punctiliar, bringing everything about political power, social power, gendered power, psychological power, the power of music, all to bear on conformity to an idol. And our world is filled with idols. Now, I have a life of idolatry. My idols are, I would like to think of them as, as sort of, um, I don't know, tasteful idols. Um, they, uh, they are just get by kind of idols. Uh, no one would know that they're in a room perhaps filled with idols like an obsessive interest in something or whatever it might be that's represented in the thing, for example, or the deference uh, that, that I may pay to someone that's really more about wanting their respect than it is really about the valuing of every person in the room equally, right? Whatever that might, whatever all of that kind of stuff might be about. I'm the president of a theological institution that has a, a global reach that is trying to try to be a source of life to the church. And yet we have our own crises. What are the, you know, the mesmerizing rhythm of incrementalism, as I mentioned, is a mesmerizing rhythm that controls academic institutions. Oh, no, 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 let's go slow. No, no, slower. <laughs> no, 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 I mean slow, not that. That creates all under the legitimacy of academic thoroughness, expertise, exhaustive source checking, all of which has its own defense, of course. That's the nature of the mesmerizing rhythm. It doesn't come out of nowhere. But it can also be falsely controlling. The same thing, of course, in the life of the church. The numbers of pastors I've heard say in the last several years, um, I can't stay at my church or, and or I can't stay a pastor because, and what usually comes out, is the mesmerizing rhythms of their congregation, which are sometimes split. So one side might be small but mighty, and sure enough, they are determined that they are going to get rid of the other and the people in the congregation are not really prepared to have a full bore conversation about what are the real issues at stake here and what are we bowing down to and what are we not bowing down to. And as a consequence, it all blows up as though it looks like it's simply a church split. When in actual fact, I would argue that it's more likely this moment in chapter three, where there is an invisible idolatries, idolatries, not just one, and it's not coming from one side and not the other, there are multiple idolatries in the room. What are we, how are we gonna sort those and be sure that we only bow down to the living God and not to anyone or anything else? Now it's in that space, it seems to me, that this text offers great hope. And, and when we come to the New Testament, which I won't now take as long to even comment on, that reality, now in the form of Rome, now in the form of all the local mesmerizing rhythms that controlled Israel as a religious institution, but also Israel as a nation, also in is uh, Israel dominated then by Rome. What does it mean to be faithful in that? And the, the poison toxicities that float around Jesus and his reputation, especially among religious people, is partly because he'll up he's upsetting the apple cart. Like this is not gonna go well for the religious authorities. That's just not how the story unfolds. And in that angular sense, then, Jesus and his disciples are meant to be salty people who live in a world of darkness and decay where we are meant to bring both some degree of illumination. It might be like a small candle, not a blazing, uh, fiery furnace, but a small candle, and that we are meant to actually embody the, the reality of that gospel story. But we have to be true to the, to the reality of our source of salt and light in order to actually be that kind of communion. So let me pause there um, and just say that I think this, for me, tees up uh, one way of describing the, the moment that we're in, the urgency, the five alarm fire, the, um, the sense of the, of the need to deeply respond to this crisis and to respond to it as near to the very core of it as possible and less and less to the circumstantial things that are manifestations of it and certainly need to be given attention, but not in the way that the, the first priority actually does. So let me stop and...